Welcome everybody to the keynote session. I especially want to welcome our guests to the University of Chicago, to the Harris School of Public Policy. Um, in the good Latin American tradition, we are a little bit behind schedule. Uh, so I'm going to be very brief, I promise. Um, I just want to take um, a few seconds to thank our students at LAM. We have wonderful students at the Harris School, but particularly this group is fabulous. Uh, last year we had a wonderful forum, it was the first one. Um, this morning has been fantastic, so so far this year is again uh, promising to be fabulous. And I think we have a new tradition, we are already looking forward next May 2015 for another spectacular forum. So thank you very much. I'm personally very proud of, of the work. I know how much work is to organize these type of events. Um, okay, let's go to work. I want to introduce our speaker today, um, Dr. Lionel Fernandez Reina. Um, you know, he's a former president from the Dominican Republic. Um, he was elected president uh, for the first time in 1996 when he was only 42 years of age. Um, he served his first term until the year 2000, and in 2004, he was elected again for the presidency, and he served two consecutive terms until the year 2012. Um, Dr. Fernandez graduated for, with honors from the law school of the Universidad Autónoma de Santo Domingo in 1978. And before he was elected for public office, he was faculty in that university, and he was also a professor at Flaxo, the Facultad Latinoamericana de Ciencias Sociales, many of you may know. Um, he taught there for many years. In his administration, he focused on the modernization of the state and um, in policies to bring macroeconomic stability to the country, investment in infrastructure, and also very prominently in foreign relations. Um, Dr. Fernandez is well known for his positive contribution to the international relations in the region. Um, as an example, let me mention that the Dominican Republic, and Dr. Fernandez in particular as a president, had a crucial role in helping Haiti directly and also facilitating the international response to the crisis that that country had, product of the earthquake in 2010. Um, this has been his, his, his role in, in, in this particular difficult situation has been recognized by the government of Haiti, the United Nations, and President Barack Obama. Um, today, Dr. Fernandez Reina is the president of the PLD, the Dominican Liberation Party. He's also a president of a wonderful foundation, the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Um, for his multiple contributions to the political science, he has been on, honored with um, titles of Doctor Honoris Causa in several universities, and he has been distinguished with lots of awards for multiple institutions and governments. And I can keep on giving you details of all this recognition he had internationally, but I think that you prefer to hear him. Uh, so le let's not waste any more time, um, please. Um, join me to welcome President Fernandez to our session. Thank you, Alicia, for your very kind and warm introduction. And I also want to thank uh, Emilio Granados for his invitation to participate in this very interesting event here. As you've heard from Alicia, I come from the Dominican Republic which is well known here in the US as baseball land. <laughs> and that is because I think we are the highest exporter of baseball players to the major leagues here in the US. I myself, when I was growing up, what I wanted to be was a baseball player. I, I had a role model, which was Juan Marichal at the time, our first Dominican ball player in the Hall of Fame. And uh, when he used to come to New York and pitch against the Mets, which was a sure shutout against the Mets, I was very proud of him, but I lacked uh, the skills to become a baseball player. But uh, as I was reminding a friend a couple of days ago, last time I was here in Chicago, I was strolling by Michigan Avenue, and I stopped at one of the intersections to wait for the, for the green light. 
and someone was like staring at me, uh, looking at me with certain curiosity. And then that person approached me directly, he says, sir, I think I know you from somewhere. And I said, well, it could be. Where do you think uh, you know me from? He says, I have some doubt, but may I ask you a question? I said, yes. He said, did you ever play for the Chicago Cubs? <laughs> so, so that's the end of it, right? <laughs> so I, I fulfill my dreams of becoming a ball player right here in Chicago, right? Well, today I would like to share with you some insights, some thoughts about current events, uh, current political, economic, social and cultural events in Latin America. But before I do that, uh, we have to put it in some sort of historical context to get some, some meaning about what is taking place at this moment in the region. And perhaps I should start by saying that since 2008, many countries in the region have been celebrating the bicentennial of our independence. Uh, independence began in Latin America in 1808, even though some would say 1804, because Haiti was the first country in the region to really gain its independence from a European colonial power. But nevertheless, it has been since 2008 that we have begun celebrating our bicentennial, and this should be until 1825, when the last of the South American countries achieved its independence, even though in our case, the Dominican Republic, it was 1844, and it was against Haiti, not against a European colonial power, which is very paradoxically. Brazil was in the late uh, 1880s, and finally Cuba at the end of the 19th century. But uh, with this bicentennial celebrations, what we're trying to portray is the idea that we have independent sovereign states in Latin America. At this moment, 33 sovereign independent states from Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. Right from the beginning, uh, when the, our nation states were created, there was an aspiration. The aspiration to build democracy. And it is because we, we uh, drafted our constitutions from the US Constitution, and were influenced by the thinkers of the Enlightenment in Europe, which thought about a division of power between the executive, the judicial, legislative power, etc. So these were the ideas that inspired our founding fathers to create a nation state and build a democracy. But for different reasons, during the 19th century, democracy was not fulfilled as a dream in Latin America. Some of our most prominent scholars in Latin America have the theory and I would say this is the prominent interpretation of why democracy did not take place in the 19th century, it was because there was a disconnect between economic development and the ideal of building democratic political institutions. And it is because there is some sort of correlation between capitalist development and democratic institution building. Here in the US, right from the beginning, it was a capitalist society in Latin America, it was pre-capitalist society. So that lack of economic development was the main reason, according to this scholarly interpretation in Latin America, why we didn't have democratic institutions in the 19th century. And this continued into the 20th century. Uh, and perhaps one of the main reasons for the Mexican Revolution that took place in, in 1910, exactly 100 years after the Declaration of Independence in Mexico was because there was this disconnect between economic development, social well-being that in Mexico meant the concentration of land among the oligarchy, right? And the peasants were left out. This lack of economic development and social marginalization was the main cause of the Mexican Revolution in 1910. And from there on, there was a tradition in Latin America of revolutions taking place in the 20th century. After the Mexican Revolution, we had 1952, the Bolivian Revolution, La Revolución Boliviana, Movimiento Nacionalista Revolucionario, MNR, the National Revolutionary Movement in 1952 in Bolivia. Mexican Revolution and the Bolivian Revolution had a sort of ideological orientation 
towards nationalism. And that continued uh, after World War II, not through a process of revolution, but coming through a democratic process in Guatemala. Uh, Juan Jose Arevalo, from 1944 to 48, and then the second government, Jacobo Arbenz. Jacobo Arbenz was elected, but he developed, he implemented a very radical nationalistic program that put him in a clash with the US government. It was right after the Second World War and Cold War policies were being implemented. Some confusion was held among US government officials at the time, <laughs> confusing communism with nationalistic policies. This was repeated in 1959 with the Cuban Revolution taking place. In its first stage, the Cuban Revolution declared itself as a nationalistic revolution. It was overthrowing a dictatorship, Fulgencio Batista's dictatorship, and it was afterwards when U.S. interests were being expropriated in Cuba and the invasion of Bay of Pigs that Cuba was declared as a socialist government in October 1961. There's the case of the Dominican Republic, 1965. It was a civic military upheaval in order to put back in office Juan Bosch, who was democratically elected as the first democratically elected president of the Dominican Republic in 1962 with the end of the Trujillo regime. He was overthrown seven months after. And in 65, as I said, it was a military upheaval to bring him back but then the response was a US military occupation of the Dominican Republic due to this mistake within policymakers to confuse the nationalistic democratically revolution in the Dominican Republic as being influenced by Cuba in making the Dominican Republic perhaps a second Cuba in the Caribbean. We had the 1979 revolution in Nicaragua, Sandinistas coming to power through armed struggle 1979 also in Grenada, uh, the New Jew movement with Maurice Bishop coming to power through revolution and this was the end of armed struggled revolutions in Latin America. There was another path, the democratic path, that also I can say in modern times began a year, after, a year before the end of World War II in, in Guatemala, the 1944 election of Juan José Arevalo. A year after, 1945, in Venezuela with Romulo Betancourt, short government, 47, with Romulo Gallegos, the great novelist from Venezuela that was elected president but also overthrown five, six months after he was elected. Uh, so we see that we have had two traditions in Latin America of how to access to power. One has been through revolutions. The aspiration originally was through democratic means. But the democratic means were obstructed in Latin America. Uh, Juan Cobarmans was overthrown. It's interesting to know that in 1952, almost at the end of Carlos Prio Socarra's government in Cuba, elections were supposed to take place. Prio Socarra was elected from 48 to 52. So elections were scheduled for 52. Interesting, Fidel Castro was a candidate for the deputy of chambers in Cuba in 1952. It was Fulgencio Batista's coup that derailed the democratic path in Cuba. And that's the reason why in 59, the revolution took place in Cuba. Because democratic access to power was obstructed by the coup d'etat uh, executed by Fulgencio Batista and his followers. Same thing in the Dominican Republic. And perhaps I have here a personal testimony of how my generation began participating in politics in my country. I grew up in New York. I would have uh, an idealistic democratic ideal you know, coming back into the Dominican Republic. But it was just a few years after the US occupation of my country. So the youth of, of, of my time, my generation in the Dominican Republic, was very active participating in politics with, uh, I would say, a lot of intellectual interests. They were combining ideology, art, politics, and looking at world affairs, interested in what was going on in Vietnam at the time, and what was taking place in the rest of the region. Uh, the, the revolts that took place in Paris back in 1968, so it was a period of revolutionary 
uh, I would say, uh, revolutionary movement that was taking place worldwide. So we wanted to participate in Dominican politics through democratic means, but there were no democratic means in the Dominican Republic at the time. There were no real free and fair elections. There were fraud that were taking place every four years. So my generation decided to participate in politics through revolutionary means. And the party we formed following Juan Bosch, who is our leader, was the Dominican Liberation Party to liberate our country from external and internal oppression. And this took place everywhere in Latin America. In Chile, for example, Salvador Allende was elected democratically in 1970. He had a socialist program, and because of that, he was overthrown. And the Chilean opposition divided in two different camps. One would seek getting back to office through democratic means. The other would try to confront Pinochet through an arms struggle. Now, all this uh, began to change precisely in the Dominican Republic. In 1978, for the first time, there was a change of power in my country between the government, Joaquin Balaguer at the time, and the PRD, the Dominican Revolutionary Party, whose candidate had won the 1978 elections, Don Antonio Guzman. And so he was elected and was able to take office in 1978. And from there on, the, year, the next year, 1979, in Ecuador, Jaime Roldos was also elected and was able to take office. And thus, a transition to democracy began to take place in Latin America that has consolidated in over three decades up until this moment for the first time in Latin American history. It has been for the first time in over 200 years of independent uh, states in the region that we have had political democratic stability for over 30 years. And it began in the Dominican Republic. Now saying that, perhaps we should look at the, at the causes that made this transition possible. Because it is a combination here of external and internal factors. And we also have to look at the peculiarities of the Latin American democratic transition, which is different of what has taken place in other regions in the world, and that can somehow explain political behavior at this moment in the region. External factors have to do with uh, perhaps what Professor Huntington from Harvard called the third wave of democracy. In Europe, in the 70s, we had dictatorships in the southern cone of Europe, in Greece, in Spain, and Portugal. And all these uh, uh, dictatorships all of a sudden collapsed. Uh, in Greece, the military were put down. Uh, there was a revolution, Revolución de los Claveles, they say in Spanish, in Portugal. And uh, Francisco Franco died of age in the Generalissimo died of age in Spain in 1976. Some of our exiles from Brazil, where there was a dictatorship since 1964, from Chile that fled the country in 73, from Uruguay, there were many of our exiles, intellectuals, who were living in Europe at the time. And they got caught up with the idea that looking at the transition that took place in Europe, in Spain, there was a transition, a very successful transition to democracy. In Portugal, it took some more time. But Greece was also a very successful model. So our intellectual and political leaders in exile thought this could be a path. Instead of framing Latin American politics in terms of fascism versus socialism, why can't we think of dictatorship versus democracy? So there was a change of paradigm that was strengthened because of the fact that an organization, the Socialist International, that until then was very Eurocentric, opened up to the third world. And some of their prestigious leaders, like Willy Brandt in Germany at the time, Olof Palme in, in, in Sweden, became interested in Latin American politics, uh, and Mario Soares also in Portugal. These prestigious leaders, democratic leaders in Europe, began supporting the Latin American cause. In, in Latin America, Carlos Andres Perez, whose party, Acción Democrática, was part of the International Socialist, was also supporting democratic transition in Latin America. 
Another key factor, which I think has not been fully recognized, is the role played by President Jimmy Carter. Human rights policy exercised pressure in Latin America to facilitate the transition from authoritarian regimes to democracies. So the combination of these external fa factors, the situation in Europe, the Socialist International, the role of these democratic elected leaders, and here in the US, Carter's policy in human rights, combined with what was taking place internally in Latin America, which was uh, dictatorships, brutal, cruel dictatorships, abuses of human rights, uh, non-recognition of human dignity, political persecution, uh, all this discredited the dictatorships, but it combined with something else that we didn't have before. It was a deep economic and social crisis, hyperinflation, budget deficits. It was at the end, the end of an economic cycle that began at the end of the Second World War, 1945, and extended up to the 70s. This economic model then came into crisis in the hands of the military. So already discredited for the human rights abuses and now, uh, and now unable to manage the economy, the combination of all these factors allowed then the transition to democracy in Latin America. But as I was saying before, our model has been different, for example, with what took place in Asia. In Asia, the transition to democracy was the result of economic development and, and social inclusion. So when people uh, uh, were already prosperous, when people had jobs, access to education, basic needs that were, that were met, then there was uh, a need to make a transition to a more stable democratic political system. So democracy in Asia, the transition to democracy, is the offspring of economic development. In Latin America, it was the other way around. It was an economic crisis. It was the uh, lack of legitimacy of our uh, military governments that enabled the transition to democracy. And this has very interesting consequences because the next decade, the 1980s, when in Brazil, when uh, in other countries in the region, the transition began, the newly elected presidents were unable to manage the economy. And so this is being labeled in Latin America as the lost decade, right? We made the transition, now we're democratic. There was a lot of joy uh, at the time, a lot of excitement in Latin America because now we're going to have governments that are going to respect our civil liberties, governments that are going to respect human rights, all that is true, but at the same time, governments that were unable to guarantee table, uh, to put the bread on the table each night. So very quickly, there was some sort of disappointment with democracy in Latin America because they were incapable of solving the economic and social crisis that was taking place. So thinking about that, the International Monetary Fund and other agencies were thinking on how to fix the economic model that had come into crisis during the 70s and the beginning of the 80s. And the idea was how can we guarantee macroeconomic stability, guarantee economic growth. And the model that was implemented is being labeled as the Washington Consensus. And even though there has been some harsh talk about the Washington Consensus, I think it should be balanced in the sense that through macroeconomic stability, through opening up of the economies, trade liberalization, uh, through privatization, somehow there was stability back again in our economies in the region. And beginning the 90s, I would say from 1990 to 1995, 96, there was economic growth. And so somehow there was success in the Washington Consensus model. But there was a deep flaw in that model. It did not consider social issues. So it was only about making the economy grow. And there was an idea about the trickle-down economy. If the economy grows, then it will triple it will, to the uh, other sectors of society. And everyone will benefit by the sole means of economic growth. Well, we had economic growth at the beginning of the 90s, but there was still a lot of poverty, a lot of unemployment, and a lot of dissatisfaction in the region. So the model began to be questioned 
Yes, now we don't have hyperinflation. Now we have balanced budgets. The economy has been growing three, four, five percent, but still there's a lot of social issues that have not been considered. So there was a criticism of the Washington consensus, the trade liberalization, the privatization that took place, combined now with a criticism of globalization. And this criticism of the Washington consensus and globalization at the same time gave a rebirth to the left in Latin America. That with the end of the Cold War, at the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s, it was thought that the left had no place in Latin American politics. Of course, the old left that were thinking in terms of Marxist Leninist ideology, that had no place anymore. But this left reinvented itself through its criticism of globalization and uh, the Washington consensus. And the first figure to appear on the Latin American political stage representing the new left was precisely Hugo Chavez, who was elected in December 1998, that was recalled a little while ago in a previous presentation here today, and took office in February 1999. I was present at his inauguration and I was sitting right next to Fidel Castro. And Fidel Castro was a little bit, I would say, surprised that when uh, Hugo Chavez began his speech, se uh, persignó. How would you say that in English, se persignó? Eh? He, he, made, he made the sign of the cross, okay. So, and, and Fidel said to me, is he so Christian? <laughs> What, what really, uh, when I think about it uh, this day, is that Fidel didn't know Chavez very well at the time. They really didn't have a close relationship. It started afterwards. So there was no linkage between what uh, Chavez originally called La Revolución Bolivariana, the Bolivarian Revolution, and the Cuban Revolution. There was no linkage because he was asking if Hugo Chavez was really so Christian, was, was so inclined to Christianity. So that means he didn't, he didn't have a personal relationship with him at the time. But what I'm trying to say is that that criticism, I would say the flaws of the Washington consensus, leaving out social issues, and the impact globalization was having uh, internationally and in the region, created the possibility of a resurgence of the left in Latin America. If, if, if you allow me, I will go back a little bit to say why specifically in Venezuela. In Venezuela, in 1959, with the end of the Perez Jimenez dictatorship, there was a, an agreement between political parties, especially Acción Democrática and COPEI, the uh, Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, which are the main two parties. And this agreement or pact called in Venezuelan history Pacto de Punto Fijo, uh, was supposed to consolidate democracy in, in Venezuela, and it did for some time. It really did for some time. But because the perseverance of poverty, of unemployment, the inadequate use of oil revenues, people felt that, and corruption, there was an uprising in 1989 as a result of the implementation of an adjustment, adjustment measures by the IMF. This is called Caracaso. In Venezuela, it's called Caracaso. When people from the mountainside came down to the city and confronted Carlos Andres Perez's second administration. And after that, he never had political stability in, in Venezuela. This is why I sometimes say that Hugo Chavez was the creation of the IMF because if the IMF would, wouldn't have applied a severe uh, uh, policy adjustment in, in Venezuela, there would not have been street protests as took place in, 19, in 1989. And from there on, permanent disappointment and disenchantment of the population with the current political regime at the time. So from what happened from 1996 up to 2003 in Latin America, this is very interesting because the first five, six years in the 90s, I talked about economic growth, but after that, we had five years of non-economic growth in Latin America. 
And that somehow nourished the idea of having a political alternative in the region. This combined with a deterioration of political parties, traditional political parties in different countries in the region. The case of Colombia. Since the 19th century, Colombia had stable political parties, democratic parties, basically two, the liberals and the conservatives. And there's an interesting uh, uh, anecdote by uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, who was asking what is the difference in Colombia between the conservatives and the liberals and he said the difference is that the liberals go to church on Sunday at 8 o'clock in the morning and the conservatives do it at 7 o'clock, which means there really was no much difference between them two. But then, at the end of the 90s, these parties began to crumble and new parties emerged in, in Colombia. Even a left-wing party, El Polo Alternativo Democratico, who came in second place in the elections that took place, I think it was in 2002. And now you have El Partido de la U. Uh, and you have some other parties, very new, recent parties in Colombia that did not exist 10, 15 years ago as a result of the impact the economic and social conditions were having in the electorate and the need for an alternative situation. So what happens uh, afterwards? What takes place between 2003 and 2013? We have in place some of what is called left-wing governments in office, uh, Evo Morales in, in Bolivia. You would have uh, Correa came in 2006. Uh, Daniel Ortega came back into office in Nicaragua. Uh, you would have Frente Amplio in Uruguay, El Frente Farabundo Martí in El Salvador. Okay, so, and it's interesting because El Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional, the Sandinistas, they took office the first time through an arms struggle and they lost power through an elections, and they came back to power through an election, which is a lesson to be taken into consideration. Frente Amplio in Uruguay, they were having an armed struggle for years in Uruguay. They came to office through Tabare Vasquez through an election. In El Salvador, uh, right after the Sandinista victory in 1979, it was thought at the time that the Frente Farabundo Martí would also take power through armed struggle in 1980 and 1981. It didn't. There was a peace agreement in Central America. But uh, Frente Farabundo Martí finally came to power through elections. And just uh, a month ago, a re-elected through Salvador Seron, who will take office in a couple of days. So some uh, social movements, some political parties that were unable to get to power through armed struggle have been uh, recently uh, capable of taking office through electoral means. Now, the question is, why did this happen? Why is it that the uh, conservative movement in Latin America lost power and the left wing has been able to win elections all these years? And the reason is that from 23 up to 2013, because of an increase in the price of commodities, especially for southern countries' export of commodities. I will talk about oil prices, natural gas, copper, uh, foodstuff, exported by countries like Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, all the others, uh, Uruguay. All these countries increased their export earnings. So they had resources that the previous governments didn't have. Uh, when I left office in 2000, the price of oil was $9 a barrel. So in Venezuela, with $9 a barrel, no government could survive. But in June 2008, the price of a barrel, a barrel of oil, went to $147. So from $9 to $147, that's huge. And because of that, these new governments uh, that differentiated themselves from the conservatives in the sense that it's not only guaranteeing civil liberties, but that we have to implement social policies, active social policies, which means uh, broadening the possibility of access to education, to healthcare, uh, creating job opportunities. All this came together and these governments became very popular and they were winning elections and winning re-elections. But it was a combination of economic growth, increase of the exports 
and the implementation of very targeted social policies that enable them to really get some support. Now we're entering a new stage. Because of the impact of the global financial crisis in 2008, is the new situation coming into being. Of course, the 2008 uh, global financial crisis did not impact Latin America as some might think. No bank uh, went into bankruptcy in the region. Absolutely no bank. So the financial sector was not impacted by the financial global crisis. It was impacted in a direct way, through international trade. So there was a drop in terms of exports and imports. And because of that, government fiscal revenues fell. With government fiscal revenues falling, then there was a decrease in public investments in infrastructure development or the implementation of social policies. So there has been a drop in the last few years in terms of political support to the progressive left-wing governments. And that's perhaps the reason why the socialist coalition in Chile lost elections to Piñera a couple of years ago. And now the socialist coalition through Michelle Bachelet has come back to power this year. Because uh, no one can really sustain itself when you have a very volatile economic conditions that impedes you to implement social policies that can impact the quality of life you know, in the region. So we're entering this stage where you, we see different economic models and different situations, different scenarios coming into the future. South America, during the last 10 years, the golden age of Latin America, sustained economic growth. Uh, you can see, if you go through any city in Latin America today, you will see the difference. A lot of infrastructure development. Uh, you, if you go to Panama, if you go to Colombia, if you go to Chile, to Brazil, if you come to Santo Domingo, which I, I, I wish you could as soon as you can, especially in the winter here in, in Chicago. But if you travel to any of these places, you will see the difference, uh, the radical change that has taken place in the last 10 years. Uh, you will see uh, tall buildings uh, with glass and steel, as you see it in the States. We have little Chicagos around Latin America. You would be surprised. We have subway systems in Latin America, even in the Dominican Republic. Now in Panama, they're building one in Colombia. Huh? Uh, there has been access to education, access to health care. I know that uh, Alicia is, is an expert in, in uh, social policies, but there has been a decrease in extreme poverty and poverty in the region in the last few years. For the first time in our history, all this combined within a democratic political framework we have moved forward in terms of our social policies for the first time. But this is due to what took place within the global economy. The South American uh, uh, countries linked themselves to China. They were exporting commodities to China, which was growing at 12%, 15%, which of course cannot be sustained forever because no one can grow forever at 15%. The Chinese economy has decelerated. It's growing now at 7%. And what has happened? That because of that, the Brazilian economy in the last two years has only been growing 0.7%, 0.9%. And what has been the consequence of this decrease in the Brazilian economy or the other economies in the region, even led by left-wing or what is labeled as left-wing governments? Something incredible. In Brazil, social protests People take into the streets in Rio de Janeiro, in Sao Paulo. And you would say, why is this? Because 20 million people came out of poverty with Lula's social policies. They are now in the middle class, but the lower middle class. And since there has been a decrease in economic growth that has impacted their daily lives, a combination of what they say is deteriorating public services in transportation, in healthcare, when you combine all that, what you have is the middle class in the streets taking protests against the government. In Chile, protests too during Piñera's government. But by whom? The students. The students took to the streets because they considered that the educational system was not fair enough, uh, that the system was not guaranteeing their access to higher education in a fair way. In Venezuela, it's the students who have taken to the streets. But why is the reason? because the economic situation in Venezuela has come into a very difficult, uh, very difficult situation. 
There has been a drop in economic growth. There is inflation, and there's a problem with the exchange rate. And this affects subsidies by the government to the university system. And because of that, the students have been protesting. But the new thing in Latin America is that these protests are not being made by the poor or the very poor for the first time as the middle class and the students that have taken to the streets because of a deteriorating economic situation that is the result of a decreasing global economic growth that is now affecting the region. So looking into the future, what can be done in Latin America? Well, first of all, I think that democracy has come to stay. I think uh, looking into the future, what we have to uh, consider is how to strengthen democracy, how to make democracy better for all, an inclusive democracy. How can we continue redefining the way we can protect human dignity and human rights? Uh, it is a question of accountability, of transparency. How can we improve our institutional mechanisms to guarantee accountability and transparency. There is a political will. There's just, we don't know how exactly, even though the problems of transparency and accountability is worldwide. It takes place in developed and developing countries at the same time. But we need to really work on that because democracy can only work if there is a perception of integrity on, on behalf of the leadership. If there is the idea that the leadership is corrupted, that it, it, it does not meet the expectations of the population, then there's going to be a political crisis and democracy will not be sustained. But then there are some other issues. Latin America has to become more competitive. Latin America must innovate. And Latin America must diversify its economic ties. And Latin America should be part of the global supply chain. If we do that, if we're able to really guarantee sustained economic development with social inclusion, environmental protection, and the protection of our natural resources, combining this with social policies, that now moving from guaranteeing access to education is the quality of education. How can we train our teachers to uh, pass on a new educational paradigm to a new generation, how can we have a global, a global mindset and a global outlook from Latin America? It's not just looking at our small respective national markets, but integrating within the global, the global picture. I think if we are able to do that, then Latin America will have a bright future. Even though I know that we still face many challenges, as have been indicated here today, the challenges of security, which is a major challenge to us, the challenge of unemployment, and the challenge of lack of high quality education. But over 30 years of permanent democratic uh, government, political stability, a growing middle class with uh, an appetite for uh, modernization, urbanized societies, never before has Latin America been as, as well as it is today, and it can be even better especially if we are able to connect our universities and our research centers with institutions of the quality as you have here at the University of Chicago. Thank you very much. collected some questions. Excellent. Let's see if I understand the handwriting. <laughs> okay, well, I have a difficult one for you. Which one, which are the best cigars and the best <laughs> rum from the Dominican Republic? I thought that it was going to be even worse, that we are going to be competing with some other islands or, but. I know the best ones are Dominicans, the rum and the cigarette. Now, I would la like to ask Felito Garcia here to name them. <laughs> Wh which is the best rum from the Dominican Republic? I don't want to get into trouble with any of the companies back home. Okay? I would say Brugal. He said Brugal. I didn't say it. He said it. Brugal and the other? 
and Davidoff. Yes. Okay. Those are the two, the two uh, most important tobacco and rum brands in the Dominican Republic. I didn't say it. Huh? Okay. I'm not on the record for that. <laughs> okay. Now that the priorities are clear. Uh, let's, let's move on so, to other questions. Um, here, somebody in the audience is um, saying that a number of private companies have been expropriated in countries like Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela, and they want to know your opinion about if these actions have been justified. I think it is important for uh, any democratic government to have a very clear rule of law and that people should abide by those laws. If you have contracts, they must be respected. And if there is expropriation, it should be compensated. If not, then we go to an independent, uh, reliable judicial system. If this doesn't exist, then we have a deficit in democratic uh, uh, operational system. Um, I'm going to use the time to, to ask my own question. Um, you were talking about students, um, now we are talking about expropriations. Um, I want to know your opinion on, on the recent events that we have been seeing in Venezuela. Um, uh, how we, I'm a little bit surprised by the lack of uh, voice that the region has had in these events, and I think um, I'm particularly concerned about what's going on, and, and um, I, I would like to hear your reflection about the situation there. Emotions apart, I think you have to put the Venezuelan political situation within a, a historical context, which is what I've always tried to do. Chavez came into office in 1998. He was re-elected in 2000, re-elected in 2006. There was a referendum uh, to get him out of office. He won that referendum. Uh, he won all the elections that took place uh, were won by the Chavistas. So you have to ask a question. Uh, was this true support or was it by fraud? I, I don't think even President Carter was there, the Carter Center, and they certified in the OAS, they all always certified that these victories, that these uh, triumphs, political victories, were legitimate. So there has been a popular backing to Chavismo historically. Mm -hmm. Now, what is taking place in Venezuela uh, in the last year, or maybe uh, even during uh, Chavez's lifetime, at the end of his, of his life cycle, is a deterioration of the economic situation. And, and because of that, now you have inflation, you have an exchange rate, which no one really understands, there is the official market and, and the black market, and recently there was a huge devaluation. That has an impact in the economy. Mm -hmm. During Chavez times, there was a lot of consumption. Now there is less consumption. So there is some disappointment with the economic and, 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 and social policies that are being implemented. That creates uh, a, a disappointment within the population. Before that, before the deterioration of the current economic and social situation, there was uh, political polarization in Venezuela. Uh, there was a large segment of the population, an important segment of the population, that disliked Chavez's style. Uh, Chavez is, comes from the military. Uh, he has a very strong, he had a very strong personality. He had a way of doing things. Mm -hmm. But at the end, uh, he never overstepped the democratic system in terms of how he got into office and how he maintained himself in office. What I think perhaps that must be uh, debated at some point within Latin American leaders, and at some point we tried with Lula, with uh, Ricardo Lagos and all the progressive leaders, is the distinction between democracy and revolution. Uh, Chavez was speaking about Bolivarian revolution. And if it's Bolivarian revolution, that could be understood and accepted because it comes within Venezuelan historical tradition and it does not go beyond the democratic system or the constitutional provisions. Now from the Bolivarian revolution, he went a step further and talked about socialism for the 21st century. He spoke about that on different occasions in a very ambiguous way. At some point it seemed that it was socialism in confrontation with capitalism 
in some other occasions, he talked about socialism as a brand of social democracy. So I think that required more conceptual position in order to really understand what was a strategic ideological outlook. Because it is ambiguous, it is confusing exactly what he meant by socialism in the 21st century. So there was political confrontation with Chavez right from the beginning, mm -hmm. but political confrontation which created a political polarization in Venezuela, which I see has really caught an emotions in Venezuela. You're labeled if you're one side or the other uh, at, at this moment. What I believe is that through dialogue, constructive political democratic dialogue, respecting each other's position, the crisis should be overcome and there should be elections again. And if the opposition has the backing of the majority, they should win. At some point, the opposition should win in a real democratic contest and then they can implement their, their program. What I think would be wrong is to take advantage of a uh, conjunctural economic and social crisis to overthrow the government by undemocratic means. Mm -hmm. uh, a coup d'etat in Venezuela should be unacceptable. There should be the right to protest, the right to say anything you want to say, and the government should be open and flexible to allow that. But at the same time, the opposition should be responsible enough to understand that the government was democratically elected and that no military coup or that no, no coup in any sense should be acceptable as a way of having access to power. And the reason is this. The reason is that if we accept a, a coup d'etat to overthrow the government in Venezuela, that will have a domino effect in the rest of the region. And once again, We'll, we'll reverse the situation in Latin America and we'll have political instability again. And because of that, all that we have achieved, all that we have accomplished in the last 30 plus years will be put in jeopardy. So for me, it's not only democracy in Venezuela, it's democracy in all Latin America. I think we should, we should have the idea that the only legitimate way of having access to office, to power in Latin America is through elections. Is to the backing of the people. We do not want right-wing military coups or left-wing guerrillas. That, that is a page that we should turn over and move forward with democratic means. Okay, thank you. Um, Presidente Fernandez, usted, um, you grew up in, in New York, and um, there is somebody in the audience that really is keen to know your thoughts on immigration reform in the US. Um, what are your reflections about that? Well, I think there's a current debate, right, taking place in this country about, about immigration reform. I'm for it. I think uh, the U.S. has enriched because of uh, immigrants coming to this country many years ago. I think the Hispanic population makes an important contribution to the well-being of U.S. society. Uh, and it's becoming more influential in every sense, even in the political sense. When you look at the Latino vote in the last presidential elections, you might say that President Obama somehow was elected by the Latinos. Uh, in the US. We have 50 million people already living in this country. The projection is that by 2050 it's going to be 150 million Latinos living in America. So the, uh, the, the idea of having bilingual, bicultural uh, persons coming into this country, uh, benefiting from uh, uh, the educational system and maintaining some sort of linkage with their families in their homeland, I think that that uh, goes in benefit of everybody. So I would very much be in favor of, of having uh, immigration reform and uh, legalizing the status of the immigrants here in the US. Thanks. Um, well, I think finally, um, it's the question that everybody wants to know. Are we running for elections 2016? That's very simple. It's like a song. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.